Now, what are some symptoms of iodine deficiency? Swelling of the thyroid gland in the neck, right? You can have a visible lump there, and it's called a goiter. You may have heard of that. Weight gain, fatigue, some weaknessness, thinning hair, dry skin, you know, feeling really cold. You, know, you might find that your hands and your feet are colder than usual. You might find your heart rate is really slow. You might find cognitively you have some learning or memory difficulties as of late. Uh, women out there, heavy or irregular periods. There's some emerging evidence that low iodine is connected to fibrocystic breasts in youth. All right, CMOS, I gotta talk about this supplement. It's a trend. So many people are asking me about it. What is the deal with CMOS? Is it the real deal? Is it healthy? Should I be consuming it? Okay, first off, let's clear something up. Sea plants are nothing new to humanity, therapeutically. We've been using it for a long time. Bladderwrack is a brown seaweed that is used in medicine. And a lot of people, especially in naturopathic and functional medicine, a lot of practitioners are using it for heart health, for cholesterol, and for thyroid. You ever go to a supermarket, look on the shelf, you know, move your eyes around, and then you see something called wakame, or dulse, or kombu. Now these are typically used culinarily, but they're also sea plants. And they're known to be high in minerals and antioxidant dense. And generally, they're supportive for your thyroid, for your skin, for your reproductive system, your brain, and just overall inflammation. That's why a lot of people really say you need to start getting in touch with sea vegetables, adding them to your salad. Um, different cultures utilize them a lot more than others. Now, there's things we're going to look for, but let's just get an idea. For generally speaking, sea vegetables can be really, really healthy. Now, the most popular one you may have heard of is spirulina. This comes from blue-green algae. Now, spirulina is pretty nutrient-dense. Right? It's, it's got B1, B2, B3, some copper, iron. It also contains a decent amount of magnesium. Potassium and manganese are there in small amounts, but it has a lot of nutrients that you really need, a lot of vitamins and minerals. And gram for gram, spirulina is one of the most nutritious foods that you can be eating. A tablespoon, seven grams of spirulina, provides a small amount of fat, about one gram. It has some omega-6, omega-3 fatty acids. It has some quality protein and considered pound for pound pretty good. It contains the essential amino acids that your body needs. And beneficially, it's an antioxidant. It's got a lot of antioxidants in there. So it can act as an anti-inflammatory, really protect your genes, your DNA. It can reduce blood pressure, blood sugar, it can be helpful for even allergies. So you get the point, right? You heard of spirulina, a lot of people use it. But the point is there's a lot of therapeutic foods coming from the sea. And sea moss isn't really new to the trend either. There's evidence that it's been used up to 14,000 years ago in Chinese medicine. We're just repeating history. It ain't nothing new. Sea moss clinically is known as chondrus crispus. And it's a type of purple slash red sea algae or seaweed, depending on where it's found. And it's also known as Irish sea moss, which you may have heard of, or Jamaican purple sea moss in the Caribbean. So what do we know about sea moss from a new nutritional standpoint? It's ultra low calorie and has negligible sugar, carbs, and fats. For two tablespoons, you'll get a small amount of vitamin A, small amount of vitamin C, vitamin K, iron, not too much. You'll get some calcium, you'll get some magnesium on a higher amount than all, some potassium, uh, but really the star nutrient in sea moss is iodine. For two tablespoons, you're gonna get about 470 milligrams. Now iodine is an essential nutrient. Approximately 30% of the world's population is at risk for iodine deficiency. And usually if you have low amount of selenium, iron, or vitamin A, iodine is usually really low too. Now what are some symptoms of iodine deficiency? Swelling of the thyroid gland in the neck, right? You can have a visible lump there, and it's called a goiter. You may have heard of that. Weight gain, fatigue, some weaknessness, thinning hair, dry skin, you know, feeling really cold. You know, you might find that your hands and your feet are colder than usual. You might find your heart rate is really slow. You might find cognitively you have some learning or memory difficulties as of late. Uh, women out there, heavy or irregular periods. There's some emerging evidence that low iodine is connected to fibrocystic breasts. In youth, you may find uh, in your children or children that you know, delayed development of permanent teeth, delayed puberty, slower mental development, uh, shorter than average height or limbs. And what are some diseases associated with low iodine? Infertility, autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid cancer and other cancers, pregnancy-related high blood pressure, learning disabilities in children, especially with an iodine-deficient mother. So we know iodine is essential.
super needed, and it's super deficient. Kind of like magnesium, not as much as magnesium, but it's really deficient in the population. Now the organ which really benefits, all of them do, but the one that really benefits the most from iodine is your thyroid. Iodine is needed to make T3 and T4. These are your thyroid hormones, right? So it's helpful for metabolism. It dictates how fast your heart beats, how deep you breathe, whether you're gaining or losing weight easily. Um, it can also help control your body temperature, cholesterol levels, your menstrual cycle, the growth and development just of a human body as a whole and the brain in a child. But remember, too much of a good thing, especially with iodine, can be bad. So in the case of iodine, you wanna make sure you're measuring it with your doctor or your endocrinologist and making sure it's at a good level. Again, a lot of us are gonna be deficient in it, so make sure you're communicating with your doctor, especially if it's really low for you. It's gonna be very, very important to bring it back up and replete it. What else do we know about seaweed or sea moss? Uh, according to an article called Bioactive Compounds and Properties of Seaweeds, a review. It's an open access library journal. Seaweeds are rich in several bioactive compounds such as polyphenols, sterols, alkaloids, flavonoids, tannins, proteins, and essential amino acids, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and many other nutrients. Now, why is this important? Because as a whole, these are gonna be really acting as an anti-inflammatory in the body. We know inflammation is driving so much of disease. Right? Anywhere where there's disease, there's a level of inflammation. This is going to act as an antioxidant, especially these therapeutic constituents that are found in it. Also, it's helping protect your cells. It's helping protect your mitochondria, right? The things that are really keeping you young, producing energy for you and keeping you young. That's going to be protected by seaweed or sea moss. So now that we know that sea moss is something that's iodine rich, on the other side of it, there's a lot of unproven claims about sea moss. You go to a lot of websites, you see some TikToks, you see some Instagram reels. They're gonna say sea moss, it's gonna enhance your hair. It's gonna clear your skin. It's got 92 of the 102 essential amino acids. If you're looking to have a kid, you need sea moss. If you have cancer, you need sea moss. Now, all these things have yet to be proven. They are working from, yeah, it's iodine rich and it's gonna help this, but we don't know exactly if sea moss does that. There's a lot of claims that are derived from seaweed too, right? So they're making claims about seaweed as a whole, but not specifically sea moss. Now, let's get to sea moss. When it comes to sea moss, the therapeutic yet controversial constituent is carrageenan. Now, carrageenans are a family of natural, linear, sulfated polysaccharides. Right? So this is the major constituent that is found, the molecule, the polysaccharides that are present in seaweed. They're controversial because there's a lot of confusion as to whether or not they're healthy or they're harmful. Now, when it comes to the benefits of carrageenans, we see some in studies. It was shown in 2015, there was a study in Biomedical Central Complementary and Alternative Medicine Journal to have a prebiotic action in the gut. Now, this is good. You hear me talk about prebiotics. It actually is beneficial for feeding the microbes in the gut. Preliminary cellular research for carrageenan is also showing that it has antioxidant activity, just as we'd expect, like all other seaweeds do. In 2003, there was a study in Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They found carrageenan to result in actually reducing blood cholesterol and lipid levels in human subjects, right? There's a human study. So we're seeing some real data and benefit of carrageenan found in sea moss to be helpful at reducing blood pressure, right? Lipid levels, this is really good because a lot of us have metabolic dysfunction. 2021 study in the Journal of Functional Foods found that the constituent, the major therapeutic constituent within carrageenan uh, regulated glucolipid metabolism in obese mice. This is an animal study uh, when they're eating a high fat diet. It's also found to help regulate the gut microbiota of these obese mice eating a high fat diet and can reduce the inflammation due to its concentration in the food in these mice. It also has, uh, as we mentioned, a prebiotic effect. So what we're seeing is, and again, to summarize that, mice fed a high fat diet were found to have benefit in their blood glucose metabolism and their gut. There's a 2004 randomized control study out of the Australian Multidisciplinary Respiratory Medicine Journal. Now this is different. This is not oral, but it's intriguing. Administration of carrageenan nasal spray, nasal spray in children and adults suffering from virus-confirmed common cold reduced duration of disease, increased viral clearance, and reduced relapses of symptoms. 
carrageenan nasal spray appeared to be an effective treatment for the common cold in children or adults. Now, if this translates to oral, we have yet to know. But it's interesting to see that carrageenan actually has some benefit as an antiviral. Now, anecdotally, I have found sea moss to be most beneficial for libido actually, and I'm not the first person who said it. Now, I haven't found really any true studies about um, sea moss and libido, or really carrageenan and libido, but it's interesting because there's a notable difference when I don't use sea moss to when I do. And um, I remember I put my roommate onto sea moss and he had said the same thing pretty fast. So um, I would actually recommend if you find that you do not have a sensitive gut, sensitive to carrageenan, Right? A lot of you uh, will find out that carrageenan is in a lot of yogurts, is in a lot of milks, is in a lot of anything that has a viscous jelly-like um, texture to it will have some carrageenan for the, for the most part. And I'll say a little bit more about it, but if you find that your gut is not sensitive to it, then go ahead and you can try sea moss. Now, what's the controversial side of it? Carrageenan, uh, over the years, has had a lot of controversy as well. There's a lot of people that say that the increase in irritable bowel disease seems to be consistent with the increase in processed foods, which we know that, but the processed foods that contain gelling agents like carrageenan. So there's a lot of claims that carrageenan is causing a lot of gut inflammation, which is interesting because there's some studies that are saying that it does the reverse and it feeds your gut biome and reduces inflammation, right? So you can see, it's not just you who can be confused. A lot of the times studies say different things, so even the experts are confused. And because carrageenan is such a popular binder or thickening agent or stabilizer in a lot of medications, foods, you also find them in toothpaste, uh, a lot of us are being exposed to it. Now, my take is this, is that carrageenan uh, is extracted and utilizes a thickening agent in a lot of foods where it's not supposed to be. Right? So we have to think back to how nature intended. It's sort of like when you think of vitamin C that's extracted from an orange or a lime or a, a pomegranate or a kuduku plum. When you take the vitamin C and put it into a capsule or put it into a, a powder that's just vitamin C isolate, we tend to want to overthink or outsmart nature. And we can't take the pharmaceutical approach to food and supplementation because we can't outsmart nature. I say that because one thing that comes to mind is us trying to outsmart nature. When we think of white willow bark, white willow bark has salicin. And salicin is actually salicylic acid, the thing that is used in aspirin. And we take that out as a pain reliever and isolate it and put it into Tylenol or aspirin. And we utilize it and it's a pain reliever, but it also causes micro cuts in our gut, micro inflammation in our gut. When we understand that white willow bark in, has salicin, right? So it has the therapeutic component, but interestingly enough, nature is so smart to protect us. And it does so because in white willow bark, you'll also find constituents that protect the gut. It's as if nature knows this ingredient can inflame the gut in isolation, so it's created with other constituents that protect you. The same goes for something like sea moss. When you have carrageenan in there, carrageenan, and we isolate it, and we utilize it in toothpaste or almond milks or different jellies, the risk for it causing gut issues or inflammation for us is much higher versus utilizing it how it's found in nature. That's always my take for things. So think about the holism, the intelligence, the synergy of the way we find it in nature versus in extraction. So with that said, actually I'm a fan of sea moss. Um, I would shop for sea moss and be very careful how you shop for it. You want to test for heavy metals, right? Because it's in the ocean, automatically you want the company to be testing for heavy metals. You absolutely want to be, to be testing for microbes. It's highly variable from company to company. You always want to avoid raw sea moss unless you're cooking it. Um, if you buy raw sea moss, make sure it's, it, it should be thin, not really thick, and it should be dry, not various color shades. Um, but really, if you're going for a company for sea moss, if it's wild crafted, make sure that it's heavy metal tested, microbe tested, it's not raw, and just protecting yourself from it. Because 
always when something is trendy, there's a lot of people coming into the game and not doing things with integrity and looking to turn a quick buck. So make sure if you are taking stimulus, which I actually am a fan of, uh, make sure you're doing it and taking care of yourself and getting a company with high integrity. I'll look into some more, maybe do a review in, in the near future. But for now, CMOS is an approved product. Check it out, see how it works for you, see if it helps.